Hello, and thank you for joining me for another episode of the Finish More Music podcast. Today, I am super excited and delighted to be welcoming no other than Suat to the hot seat. So this is a young man who's blown up massively in the last year. You've probably seen him on Instagram, but he's on YouTube. He's now got his own Beatport show, absolutely killing it. He plays kick-ass house music excellent DJ, very, very serious about what he does, but he's brought a huge amount of humor, injection of fun, brought a lot of light into people's lives in a year that's been difficult for a great many people. So excited to dive deep into his motivations, find out all about how he pulls this off and what drives him to be so consistent. Zach, thank you so much for joining us, buddy. It is a real pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. I mean, like I said, uh, when we were talking before, you know, I'm an absolute fan of the podcast and, and the way that you do things in such a clear way. So I'm absolutely gassed to be in the hot seat and uh, hi everyone watching. Yeah, fantastic. Well, look, let's dive in because I'm sure I'm not the only one who's wondering now that things have blown up for you and we'll, we'll backtrack in a little while because I'm keen to uh, sort of chart the, the journey because it's, there's been a real uptick, but I know you've been working at it for a long time. It's not like a flash in the pan thing, but right now it's super busy. You've got loads going on. What is a day in the life of you like at the moment? Um, wow. Uh, yeah, it's pretty hectic. I can't lie. Um, a lot of it's made up with sort of um, calls, you know, on Zoom, as I'm sure everyone in this lobby has experienced over lockdown. Um, so a typical day in the life of me is, uh, you know, wake up at half five, uh, go for my 5K walk or an hour walk. I do. It's probably a bit more like six and a half K now. Um, and come back, you know, I don't, I don't actually have lunch. People are like, oh, breakfast is the most important meal. I don't actually have lunch until like one, two o'clock. Um, I'm usually editing videos or uh, on calls with, you know, my manager or agent sort of discussing how we want to plot the next, uh, the next season. Um, I'm a big fan of sort of thinking one step ahead in terms of like, we already know what we're doing next season now. I feel like if you're, if you're on that sort of constant progression, then you kind of never slow down. Um, but yeah, so it's made, mainly comprised of either filming a video, editing a video, <laughs> posting a video, or some combination of recruiting new music um, from you know, my, my countless filled promo inbox. Um, I, I'm in quite a blessed position because I have uh, a public promo inbox and I get music from all over the world from all kinds of people. And I think that really sort of helps my music catalogue and taste. Um, uh, a lot of people have access to, you know, your beat ports, your discogs or DJ or wherever you grab vinyls. But I'm getting stuff that's like just fresh out of Ableton or fresh out the door. Um, and so I'm just either making music, listening to people's music, playing music on the street or walking or sleeping. <laughs> that's <laughs> boring, Love but I'm, I'm, I'm reserving the fun for the clubs. Do you know what I mean? So let's let's dive back then. Uh, when did this all kick off? Like the the DJing and the music, and when did the live streaming come into it? Because I know, you know, I've, I've saw you before. You were actually doing the stuff, wandering around with the rig, and there are various kind of incarnations of things and cooking and all sorts of stuff going on. So yeah. I'm really curious if you can give us a rundown of the the journey like where the music started, where the live streaming started. And you've just talked about like having a manager and all of this stuff and a promo box. How did we get to this big uptick? Yeah, uh, I would say that in summary, the answer is not all of a sudden. Uh, it's a very, very slow burner. Like with, you know, as you know, with anything that's worth having in life, it, it takes time to build the, the foundation. Uh, and then ultimately get to the end goal. So um, to give a quick overview, um, you know, I was very much part of like drum and bass and dubstep when I was growing up. Um, UKF dubstep was basically like my life. Um, and that kind of subsided. I, I, I went to secondary school and uh, uni. And at uni, I was doing like a, a really, really tough engineering course at Imperial College London. And it just wasn't the course for me. Um, I ended up basically dropping out because I was just so unhappy with the way everything was going there. Didn't really have many friends. I was quite, um, I was quite isolated at that university. Uh, not to mention the incredible workload that a university like that, uh, you know, puts on you. I went, I went there to be, you know, a guy that was doing what Elon Musk is doing with brain machine interfaces. And that was really my interest. And then when it got down to like the programming side of stuff and like code and all of that stuff, I was like, you know what? I don't even like this anymore. So I dropped out and uh, it sounds really, really cliche, right? Uh, 
I didn't know what I was doing at all with my life. Um, all kinds of, you know, gambling, just the, the place you don't want to be falling into when you're an 18 year old. Um, and so uh, I didn't know what to do. And it sounds really cliche, but very much the DJing found me. I was like, I was so literally so far hopping at a mate's house. And one day uh, his brother like pulled the decks out and I was like, wow, that's like really, really interesting. Like what, I, I think what it did, what did it for me when he just like switched the bass knob off, he put the bass knob at minus infinity and it cut the bass and he brought it back in. I was like, wow, there's just something just has turned in my brain there. And it was very much like, the ability to manipulate crowds with your fingers in a weird way like a puppeteer i don't know something along those lines right so that was about four years ago and i just was infatuated with it like i got decks straight away like i t <laughs> i took my student loan and spent it on decks straight away uh never paying that back by the way um, <laughs> and um and so i just became infatuated with it you know and i thought right all, there's all of these djs that i became friends with on facebook and they're doing the the standards, you know, head down, dark room, vibing away, playing for themselves, basically. And I thought, how can I sort of like take this market and like flip it on its head? So live content was there from the start. It was very much a case of if it's live, then I can directly say, oh, shout out Greg Moore, who's in the chat now. Or, you know, uh, big ups Keith, who, who I'm talking to right now, as opposed to kind of performing to an audience that is not really there. So they're after the video. So live content was there from the start. And, um, I've always been an entertainer in terms of I did stagecoach when I was at school. I did the choir. I did plays, uh, all of that kind of stuff. But when I went to uni, this was very much suppressed because there just wasn't time for it. Right? All I had time for at uni was gym and crying in my bedroom, basically. That was all I, that was all I had time for. Um, so it's very much suppressed. And then when I came out of uni and found this thing, which was like super expressive, I kind of, again, cliche line, found myself. And it was very much like, okay, now I can be this performer and I don't have to necessarily have to have a CV or I don't have to do anything. I can just do exactly what I want to do. Um, so I've been doing, you know, the, the DJing and the live streams for about four years, but it was very much when it came to the start of lockdown um, after I had uh, test run a, uh, a workout show called House Workouts, where I'm basically prancing around my, my living room whilst trying to teach a workout show. And it just wasn't working while mixing, obviously. Then I kind of came onto this thing called Mix and Munch, which is like my own cooking show. I'm very much into my cooking and fitness. So I thought, okay, these things could work if I tied them in with DJing. Um, they both didn't because it's very much like I've got a mix while doing this and it's all, it's all going wrong. So um, I thought, how can I incorporate like my hour of exercise, which is what we were like allowed in the UK. It was like one hour um, of exercise um, with my DJ live show. And so I basically made this rig, which is modeled off when you used to go to the cinema and someone would sell ice creams from that sort of tray that they hung around their body and it sort of sits down by their waist. That was what I modeled it off. Um, I made it out of a tarpaulin and the top of my desk because I thought, I don't need my desk anymore. I'm not at uni. Um, let's strap it to me and see if it works. Um, and it very much did. You know, I, as soon as I made it and, and, and put it on, it was you know, excruciatingly painful, but there was something in my mind that was like, this is going to be big. This, this, this is going to work. Cause I just knew straight away that no one's doing it. Like no, no one's doing it. Um, so captive audience over lockdown, a concept that has never been done before combined with sort of the, the performance traits that I developed over the last three years led to this kind of, you know, this big project that, that, that everyone sees and, um, you know, multiple revisions later of the rig and, you know how i interact with people and what really works and what doesn't work uh is you know it's completely snowballed into this thing that i i, I could never imagine um and i just hit uh, literally yesterday i hit a uh, hundred thousand likes on my facebook page which was something that like a year ago i was like yeah i'll probably do that in five years like let's aim for that like as a, a long-term goal uh and now it's almost at a point where like the the sky's the limit with it and uh i'm i'm at no point ready to stop um i'm working every single day to improve not just my fitness not just like my athletic ability but sort of my mentality with how i work and how i speak and everything like that i feel like it's very much a case of when you're a dj you're you're a brand you're like a, a public figure kind of thing and i think a lot of djs yeah they produce great beats and they play great beats but they lack in all of the other aspects of, of what it is to be like a, a public figure um so 
with, without waffling too much, that's a, a, a rough summary backstory of uh, how I got from, you know, sue out with a phone to sue out with a phone. <laughs> yeah, no, totally. So just talking about the, the followers, like let, let's say Instagram followers, where were you at last year when you started doing this? Was it about April, something like that? You first yeah. went out with the, the like the rig. I know it's, it's not yeah. the rig, but a rig, the ice cream selling rig. When you yeah. first started going out with the ice cream selling rig to now, yeah. What has been the change in followers and how has that multiplied? Uh, well, I would say that the word to describe it is exponential. Um, it's very much a case of, you know, it starts to pick up and then you blink and it's doubled. And then you're like, how has it doubled? I thought, and then it triples because all of those people are sharing their content. So to give you a rough summary, um, on the 20th of May, 2020, I had 3000 followers on Instagram. Yeah, so, so not bad growth, not bad growth. And on that same day, I also had 12K on Facebook and now it's at 150, so or 155. Like that. So the, the growth is very, very exponential and uh, it, it makes you realize how many bloody people there are in the world. Because it's like, if I like this piece of content, I share it and five of my friends might see that piece of content of which three of them might like it enough to share it. And then it's very much, it's like multiplying bacteria. It's like one doubles to two and then four and then eight and 16. And before you know it, like, you, you know, you're in the thousands of followers. And by no means does uh, the followers or anything like that make you happy. And people should definitely not say, you know, when I'm older, I want to be at 150,000 followers because that is definitely not something to aim for. What people um, don't realize is all of the stress and all of the perhaps negative aspects of having a lot of a big following. But what followers is good at doing is measuring if you're improving or if you're improving social media wise or if you're being shown to more people or if more people are engaging with your with your content. Um, you know, before the call, we spoke about how I've got a couple of guys who I offer one to one tuition with on Patreon. And I say to them, right, we're going to work at this content plan. If your followers don't double or triple in the next couple of weeks, we're doing something wrong because it's very, very easy to go from 10 followers to 20 followers. Right. It's much harder to go from 75,000 followers to 150,000 followers in a couple of weeks. Um, and however, if you're not growing in followers, then you're not being shown to more people. And therefore, something tells me that maybe it's not unique or, you know, there's someone already doing it bigger and better. Or you just need to rethink your strategy. Um, yeah. Alrighty, so I'm going to jump back a little bit because my radar went off a little while ago when you were talking and you were saying, look, I've just like I put on this rig and I've gone out and then I've refined my process. So I've refined how I'm interacting with people, refined the rig, refined how I'm DJing. And what that speaks to is something that I, I talk to a lot and I absolutely love, which is action creates clarity. So a lot of people would go, ah, oh, you know, I got this idea. I'm going to wait until I got the perfect rig. I'm going to like practice this behind the scenes. I'm going to yeah. hold back. I'm going to like, oh, what will people say? I'll get this just right before I move forward. You are obviously a shining example of someone who's actually gone, no idea, test it. Like we call it like minimum viable product in the business, right? But ultimately you've gone, how do I make this thing work? Let's go yeah, that's working. Now I'll get better. Now I'll get better. Now I'll get better. How do you, um, because this is very much in a public eye thing, what advice would you give to people? Because I know a lot of people listening to this will be, you know, making their music or wanting to DJ. They'll have concerns about what people think. You've gone out and been like super big, super bold. You're like, way or ahoy, whatever you want. You know, I'm over here. What advice would you give to people who, who kind of hold back and they're worried about what people will say? Um, I would say, uh, you know, I, uh, I'm a massive fan of the, of the three line sentence, F the haters, or three word sentence, F the haters, you know. It's very much a case of, um, you know, in a place where there's so much saturation and so many people doing the same thing, um, the, if you do something different, the worst that's going to happen is that it doesn't succeed. The best thing that's going to happen is that you overtake everyone else who's doing the same, same, same shit. I think uh, 
people are really scared to be kind of like bold and out of their comfort zone. But from my experience, like I've grown the most as a person, as a DJ, as you know, a boyfriend or anything along those lines um, when I'm outside my comfort zone. I think you've got to think about it like if at any point in your journey you're left thinking what if you fucked up pardon my french um because um at the at the end of the day when you're 85 and looking back on your life you don't want to be looking at it like oh what if i did do that and and, and try to run that out i think yes uh, to you know to be a, a successful producer dj you have to put the work in 100% but in a world where everyone wants to be a DJ and everyone wants to be, you know, a Formula One driver and all of these different things, look at the people who are like rising ab above the rest of the people. It's the ones that are in some way unique. Uh, for, I, I don't know if anyone watching this sort of um, ha has seen Formula One or, or watches Formula One or anything like that. But there's a couple of guys that are really, really sticking out in Formula One because they don't take themselves so seriously. And they're very much the vibe of your guy next door and an approachable personality not you know you wouldn't understand what i do because i i, I i'm amongst g-forces all day and you wouldn't understand what it's like to be in a formula one car that's that's exactly how you sort of don't grow a fan base so i think people are scared of coming across as a normal person in a way people want to be this this professional you know i'm a dj or i'm a producer and i don't find that funny or anything like that but when you let go of that and kind of be who you are people take people take you with so much more love and encourage and people people want to be around you no one wants to be around a dj who doesn't have any contact with their fan base and doesn't interact with you and you know it's just don't forget what djing is and obviously this this idea can be extrapolated onto anyone's profession don't forget what djing is it's about including people it's about making people dance it's about sharing the moment with people so like more and more you're seeing in this industry, like stages that are 50 feet high, the DJs are up there, the crowd is in, in here in sort of like the pit and there's not that connection there with, you know, yeah, I mean, I'm sure you can think of countless festivals where there's not that connection and they're losing it, but that's what DJing is about in the first place. So going back to my project, that's exactly what I do. I, I'm, I'm in your local Tesco and I'm still playing the beats that I love and showcasing the sound that I, you know, I want to play and the sound that I'm passionate about. But as soon as it becomes in a, in a relatable place where, hold on, he's in Tesco, like I shop at Tesco, it's instantly that rapport. And I think that's what a lot of people are missing is like, you're a human, not a cyborg DJ. You're a human DJ. So make mistakes. Uh, and the more you make mistakes in the public eye, like I, <laughs> I press the pause button on my sets regularly, but no one gives us, no one gives a crap. Do you know what I mean? It's, it, if you make light of it, but if I was like, oh my God, uh, turn the live stream off quick, it, people pick up on that as well. You've just got to be, you've just got to be, you know, a you human. laugh it out. Yeah, 100%. And you, you've got to laugh it out. And I think people pick up on that. And like I said, if you're in that dark, dingy club environment that looks very much like a club that 75 year old Karen doesn't understand because she's never been to a club, straight away, you're not getting a click. Whereas 75-year-old Karen recognises Tesco Express because she shops at it every day. So straight away, I'm getting a click. Um, so people are like, oh, how has your, your fan base grown so much over a short amount of time? Well, more... There's a lot of 75-year-olds in it. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Karen loves me. Um, <laughs> but, but it's because I'm, I'm broadening the amount of people that want to see me or, or that want to click on the content by making it relatable or perhaps the comedy aspect or perhaps the approachable aspect. Um, as soon as you take it into that club environment, it very much says 18 to 25 year olds. Um, and, you know, I'm sure we'll get into this, sometimes perceived negatively. There's a stereotype around sort of like doof, doof clubs and what that can bring, you know, you know, in the news about overdoses and, and it being like a, an, do you see what I'm saying? There's a bit of a stereotype associated with it. As soon as you remove that, it's like loads of views, loads of clicks, because that's what people can relate to. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, picking up on so much that you're you're saying there as well, because I used to love DJing in smaller rooms. I used to love the connection of it more, but simultaneously done exactly the same, turned the wrong deck off in the middle of a set, went way like that, 
everyone laughed, went worry like that, tunes went back on, party continued. Was yeah. I hurt, damaged, dead, reputation ruined? No, nothing happened. My mate did probably the most classic ever when we just started out in a really small club, I think about 100 people. And he did the, de the uh, Jesus pose and he stepped back as he did it and he kicked the plug out that was powering the decks and everything went off. So he's DJ posing it in front of 100 people, like mainly our mates. And like, it's, it's just a great story to tell. Yeah, exactly. Did it ruin the party? Did, did everyone think, oh, he's the worst dude in town? No, like it's, it's totally fine. These things happen. So I love it. The idea of the more human connection and bringing yeah. that back into, into things, I think is super important. Um, so going into, in fact, no, let's jump into the future and then we'll get back into the now again. We talked about this massive up, uptick. Like, and I know you've got, club gigs you've got all sorts of stuff that's coming up what is your vision of where this is going so you talked about planning for the next season but if we were to look like long term yeah. what would you love this to turn into for you well um i'm not a very well traveled person so kind of like a, a, a dream of mine, like a, before I even knew I was doing this, was I want to travel with work, with my profession. Um, fast forward to kind of, you know, now that all of this stuff's happening, it's very much a case of like, I want to be able to make video content all over the world, um, doing what I do, still like kind of that same like rawness, that authenticness, but just in the most crazy places. Um, you know, when we were speaking before, I mentioned that now it's at a point where I don't even need to get a booking at a place. If I can walk there, I can have a party there because I just attach it to me, right? Um, so I guess, you know, a real a real proper goal of mine, I've got two kind of brands that I want to work with um, as like goal brands. One would be um, Red Bull. Um, we had an inquiry uh, from Red Bull at the end of last year. Uh, and it got delayed because of, you know, the pandemic and stuff like that. But definitely extreme with Suat is kind of where um, one of one of the goals, you know, I want to be able, I want to be whitewater rafting whilst mixing, whilst live, whilst on the microphone, <laughs> or abseiling or, you know, anything. But Get insurance on that equipment, young man. But shot, you know, cinematically with drones and all of that stuff. It's still, you know, just your boy, your boy next door. But I'm, I'm doing it with Red Bull now. And then the second thing is um, I would ideally like to have a Netflix series called, um, well, I, I mean, maybe the people in the comments can let me know which one they prefer. Either The Passion with Suat or Sightseeing with Suat. Um, so there's two seasons. There's the Ancient Wonders of the World and there's the Modern Wonders of the World. Again, places that I've never, ever been near in my life. Um, so... You know, you know, you've got Machu Picchu, you've got Chichen Itza, you've got the Pyramids of Giza, all of the, you know, the classic kind of worldwide renowned monuments and locations. And I'm stepping with people in the background and we're very much enjoying like a one off bespoke party. But I'm reeling off facts about the area that we're in. What, you know, how long has this Mexican jungle been here? Um, this is a spider that's only found in this region. And when we spoke about this again i'll just explain to the fans when you begin to stack depth in your content so now it's tourism plus comedy plus music plus you know entertainment or inclusiveness with everyone then it's got real legs for a netflix series i think when people probably hear me say that first they're like you netflix but it's got legs to it once i start reading off facts and i'm touring the world and it's you know 4k cinema style cameras then that I really believe the world is my oyster. And uh, that is always a kind of a long-term goal of mine, you know. Um, the, the, there's brands that we kind of have, we've had to turn down brands that I would never have imagined um, turning down in, in, in sort of preparation for this alignment with Netflix, which is ultimately like, like an ultimate goal of mine. Um, and another thing would just be, you know, I just want to shut down like 25,000 capacity st like festival stadiums um, and just like play the, play the, the dirty underground house music that I play just on sound systems that are like, you know, football fields in size. Um, but yeah, it would definitely be, you know, the, the Red Bull contract, Extreme with Suat and Sightseeing with Suat on Netflix. That's for video content wise. I mean, obviously I've got 
goals in terms of to look after my family and make sure they're sweet forever and all of that cliche stuff but those are my two biggest focuses right now love it well why the hell not i think it sounds great now one thing i'm curious there is you mentioned like playing the, the underground clubs and all of that stuff what would people expect to see if they come to see you in that kind of club environment just i just i can't describe it other than just wobblers basically like i i play like a uh, I play quite a, um, I would say it's quite, it's quite an old school sound of house music. It's, it, you know, it's, it's made by new people or, or new releases, but it's kind of emulating that kind of like old school sound. Uh, I really like kind of like disco edits. A lot of the stuff that I play is very like disco inspired with the bass lines and the, and the way that the instruments come in and out uh, and the kind of like stabs and vocal like ha ha and all of that stuff. Um, but when people come and see me live, you know, it's going to be, it's very much a journey. Like in my mixes uh, on, on Facebook and YouTube and Twitch and whatever, I always try and have a bit of a, a, a journey where it sort of like, you know, crescendos and builds. Um, but when I've got, that's because I've got like an hour or two hours. But when I've got an extended set, like uh, for example, at Night Tales on Thursday, or I've got a, a really long set in, um, in Lincoln, um, I very much want it to be like a journey where people feel certain ways during the night um and 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 but nonetheless not cheesy in any respect it's still like dirty beats that people i'm hoping have never heard you know what one of the most commonly asked questions that i get is what's the name of that track and that's how i want to keep it i i don't as, for me as soon as some as soon as my neighbor or you know my my friend who's a dj has heard the track i'm not interested in it um, I'm, I'm, I work really, really hard every single week to recruit new music, to rip the pile of vinyls over there and make sure that no one's heard the, the tracks that I'm playing. Uh, and that's how I want to keep it. So when you come to the club, it's still the same, you know, exploration and I'm showcasing new sounds, but on a, a, a tremendous sound system, how it's meant to be listened to. And is there going to be comedy microphone and stuff like that? Or there's a different version of Suat in the club? No, no, uh, no, I'm not going to be like, I'm not going to be narrating on the microphone. That's very much like an engagement live stream factor. Um, when it comes to the club sets, it's, you know, it's, it's full on beats. Love it. Okay. Well, look, I'm definitely going to have to come and check out one of the, uh, the sets with you, my friend. Sounds awesome. And um, so if we go, you mentioned the, the live streaming and obviously, you, you know, huge congratulations with your show on Beatport, which is fantastic. Let's talk about how you pull that off. How do you manage to stream that? What is your rig? What is the technical side of things? You mentioned previously that sometimes people say like, oh, he's not got any music playing and this, that and the other one, which yeah. is like complete nonsense. What actually is happening? What's like the behind the scenes? If we, we see you on the camera, but if we were to be you seeing what's going on, what is actually happening? So uh, I've got the rig there and once I kind of explain it, I'll kind of show you guys, I guess. But um, what it essentially is, is the, the decks have to be in front of me, right? So that I can look down and mix at them. Um, and for the decks to sit in front of me, there has to be a weight that's equivalent to the decks behind me. So that the center of gravity is basically like on my waist. Uh, you know, in the, first, in the first one that I made with my desktop, um, the center of gravity was like over there. And it was hurting my neck and not the right thing to do. So essentially what it is, is it, it's the decks. There's a counterweight which balances it. And then there's um, a camera arm, which is the what the camera sits on. Uh, and that's what you that's how you guys see that view where it's like kind of in front of me. And it travels with me. It's, it's an all-in-one thing. Um, the rig is kitted out with um, four subwoofers and four top speakers. Um, and they're all kind of like wired into the frame of the rig. I'm just going to show you guys now. So, um, okay. So. The kit. That's the speaker. 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 And that's the speaker. So this is upside down. But the way it works is I go in there and the, the decks sit on top of the frame. So with the ball. With the, um, you know, with the counterweights there, the whole thing weighs a, a real lot. And I think people were kind of like, how do you do it? Well, it's just the physics of it. The fact that the center of gravity is sitting on my, on my midline. 
Um, if it wasn't the case, I would be in agony. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's not for everyone. Like, it's very <laughs> heavy. It's 35 kilos, right? So it's like half a child or <laughs> half, half an adult, I should say, a full child. Um, um, should my next question be when and how did you measure half a child? <laughs> like, how did you weigh half a child? <laughs> what happened to the other yeah, half? Uh, yeah, that, that's probably for the after hours podcast, right? Um, but but yeah, so that's the way that the, you know the physics of the whole thing works. And the general consensus is we we choose a location, um, we go to the location with my I've got like a hotspot, which is like a four G hotspot. And we basically walk the route that I would do. Um, so it's, you know, people are like, uh, uh, I don't know how you do that. <laughs> and like, oh, or, you know, I, they see me do one live stream a week. But it's very much a case of like, there's a lot of prep that goes into it. Um, from even just the people that I shout out on the live stream, that's all planned. Um, because, you know, there's people that are sending stars and donations and new Patreon. So it, there's, pe there's people that need to be shouted out on the live streams. But basically, we walk around the route with um, a 4G signal checker. And um, if at any point along that route, we drop below two bars of 4G, um, we generally don't do the route and we find another one. Um, and it kind of works like we say we're going to start here and we're going to finish at that same point. And we basically like zigzag up a town or you know inc incorporate a, a mode of transport, like you might have seen the kayak or the bus or, or any of that thing, just to increase. It's like that depth thing again. Yes. The baseline, the baseline is that I'm stepping with Sue out. I'm walking around playing tunes. That's the baseline, and you know that it's going to be good music. Then you add like McDonald's or Tesco or something that's relatable. Then you add a mode of transport that's like no way, that's like impossible. And the more you can kind of stack the the, the, the stack the assets within the content, generally the better the video does online. So, uh, just to give you a, a, an idea of that. Uh, you know, my Friday night shows um, where I'm just, it's just very much me and the camera and my sound system in my house and playing beats and interacting with the fans. That's got a white backdrop. So there's not a lot of depth to that. So that gets about 50,000 views each time I do it. Whereas when I go to Brighton and I did this uh, at the end of last season, there was, you know, someone who sung on the microphone. Loads of people who danced in the street with me. Um, all you know, every second something else was happening. You turn the corner, there's a new guy, there's a juggler. It was just mental, right? So that edit has five million views. So as soon as you can stack the the assets within the content, all the different value stacks up, then it just goes viral. And I think that a lot of people making content or or you know trying to grow their profiles or whatever don't understand some fundamentals about social media, about how how am I going to um, incentivize people to not only like my posts and comment on my posts, but share my posts and follow me? Um, and once you break it down like that, it's like, holy crap, no wonder if this hasn't been working for me because those incentives aren't there. You've got to think about, okay, why, why would someone click follow if they don't even like the content? Why would someone uh, comment? Oh, why would someone share if they don't even comment on the content? So it's kind of like a cascade. First, you get someone to like, then you get someone to comment, then you get someone to share. And by that point, they're probably up for following you. And when someone follows you, that basically says, I want to receive more of this person's content. I like this person's content. I want to see more of it. So until you get to that stage, you're not going to be growing in followers because no more people are going to be saying, I commit to liking your content. So it's very much a case of you've got to be continuously putting out content, as you know. Um, that is valuable to people. Um, you know, it, putting out content continuously that doesn't give value to anyone is not going to set up what I call a value exchange, where it's very much like, this person has given me loads, I'm going to click like. This person has given me loads, I'm going to give them a comment. That's like how the human brain works with social media. It's a value exchange. And if you don't have that set up in your content, then you're never going to gain more followers. You're never going to grow as a profile. Um, sorry, I've went off on a tangent. I just thought no, that is great, man. It's absolutely, absolutely uh, superb stuff. I mean, I think the the interesting insight for me is how much is going on behind the scenes because it's really easy. You know, whenever you see anything, right? We see a TV show, we see whatever, we see thirty minutes of that. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the Finish More Music Workshop, for example. They're like yeah. twenty minute episodes of this, and 
it looks like, well, that was just filmed there and that film. People have no idea what goes on behind the scenes to make that work. So in the second episode of the workshop, I'm in a club and we did this in a pandemic. And like Dan from my team called ahead, managed to get this club for us. We turn up. They haven't bothered to tell us they've been using it as like a, a junkyard, basically. There's everything from sofas to old World War I motorbikes and like all this stuff. We've got all these scenes we've got to film in that short period of time because you've got a window of time to get this thing done. There is a dude who's a welder on site welding stuff. And so we clean all of this out, get it all set up between his blast of welding. I've got to do takes. There's all this mad stuff. That's just on the day. <laughs> and of course we're hearing the same sort of thing from you you're going ahead right we've got to make sure that the signal is there i've got to get the rig right and make sure that's working i've got to get the tunes right we've got to stack up the different layers in the planning of what we're going to do to make sure that this is something that gets more eyeballs shares likes comments on it there's like a, a full piece in the background and you know your you uh, said your good lady as well is uh, is full time with you on this now that's how much work there is for you guys to do yeah definitely well like you know replying to messages is a full-time job in itself and you know lucinda's my girlfriend is really really efficient with it and she she helps me with all all kinds of stuff uh, and i definitely wouldn't be doing this or sat here you know making a living off of the suit project without her helping me on all of the ones up until the first one that we monetized and even then you know once you start what people don't understand is they see someone with a million views uh, or you know 10 million views and they go he must be loaded and it's just very much not the case there's all kinds of different stages to get monetization and it's only now that you know after it's been you know four years in the building one year of just like there she is in the comments of just solidly smashing it that is at a point where we can both make a living off of it um but yeah i think you especially with social media um you have to be super analytical with it you have to look at it and go okay this has worked this hasn't worked why is that how can we compare these two posts or two content pieces or two pictures or whatever it is and how can we analyze it because if you're not doing that and you're not kind of like what i call a b testing if you're not saying okay this really worked this didn't work let's try this method again and has it worked again yes okay there's something there that is working you might not necessarily know what it is at first, but unless you're looking back at your portfolio or your content reel and going, this really works, let's drill into that. Um, this doesn't work, let's never ever do that again. Then, then you're never gonna grow. It would be like having a business, right? Where say we're selling drinks and we go to a festival and we sell our whole stock and completely sell out. And then we go, what are we doing next week then, Karen? And we go, oh, I don't know, let's just go to that stool market again. Let's go to that market in the center of town. And it's like, well, why would you do that? Because the festival is what works. So go to the festival and, sit and sell out. Um, so, it's, you know, that's a, a crap analogy, but that's very much how social media works. It's like some things work, some things don't work. And generally what I've learned for anyone that's watching and wants kind of golden nuggets of information, it needs to be super clear, whatever it is. If it's a picture, if it's a caption, uh, if it, whatever it is, it, slang doesn't work. It needs to be super clear. Think about the fact that you have an international audience or you want to appeal to an international audience. So generally, puns don't work. It needs to be super obvious and kind of spoon-fed. It needs to be vibrant and colourful and, you know, visually clear. Um, a lot, you know, when I'm deciding on thumbnails for my pieces of content, I choose about... 10 different screenshots of thumbnails and say okay these are the ones that i like and generally it goes that's got too much going on that's got too much going on that's got too much going on because ultimately people are scrolling all day through content and what is going to catch someone's eye is if it's big bold clear vibrant and really easy to consume no one wants to watch a you know a seven hour documentary on how to become a dj but people will consume a one minute clip easily and when you get people consuming it, you build up that rapport, like with you, like with uh, you know, I am Keith Mills, finish more music. People are uh, accustomed to that kind of content, so you develop a fan base for that kind of content, and you get shares and you get followers and you recruit new followers. Um, but if your content is difficult to consume, uh, low resolution with how it looks, um, dull colored, then just to the human brain, just physiologically. Think of, think of yourself as like a magpie, right? 
what would a magpie like to look at? It would be the bright, shiny thing, not the thing that, you know, you can't really make out what it is. So that's kind of how the human brain works when scrolling through social media. They're going to stop at something that's clear and vibrant and bold and really easy to consume, not at something that says, oh, six hours long. Probably not going to watch that because inherently the society that we live in is lazy. People want everything instantly. People want, you know, if your Amazon order that says it's going to arrive tonight actually arrives tomorrow, you get pissed off because that's what we've been led to. to, to that's the way that we live, right? It's instantized. You post something, you get likes after a second. Um, you order something, it arrives at your house tomorrow. So make content that is for that instantized society. It really easily consumed, really bold and bright. And then if you can stack it with you know, comedy, great music, fun, whatever it is, the, 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 the more depth you have to your content, the further it's going to go and the more shares it's going to get. Yeah, love it. So just talking about the, the stacking stuff, I, it would be remiss of me not to, to find out with all the various modes of transport and all the, the crazy stuff that you've done, what has been your favourite show and why? Oh, my favorite. favorite moment uh, uh, I was I was saying to you like this the simple things for me it's you going like can I get an ahoy sir and the kids geese are just going Fuck off like yeah. that for me like that and we talked about the edit and how important that is but for you in the moment what's been like a, like you've you've ended it taken the rig off and gone oh man that that was killer yeah um I mean you know it's, it's quite hard to kind of pinpoint one but um, one that really, really stuck out for me uh, was when we were on tour and we were in Newcastle. And just, I just want to rewind. When I started making live videos, like in the library, for example, or in your local KFC or anything like that, something that I always wanted was I want to be able to put a pin on a map and have a party anywhere. And people just turn up out of nowhere. Fast forward to the UK tour, we're in Newcastle. Uh, in the absolute pouring rain, like like complete northern weather, like it's pouring. Like I don't know if you've seen how I waterproof my decks, but I basically you know put them in this this vacuum wrap and um, and they're watertight. So it's pouring with rain. You know we're exhausted from doing like the countryside stream the day before, like walking through you know two hours through the hills with the decks on. It's just exhausting. Uh, and we're setting up in the pouring rain. Basically, me and Lucinda are looking at each other like, I don't want to do this. I don't know why I'm doing this. I hate my life. You know, all of the things when you're in like a, a negative space, when you're tired and all of that, all the stresses. And so I start walking into the center of town and then like over the horizon come like five lads like marching in the, in, pardon me, in the pouring rain, right? In the absolute pouring rain, in their raincoats with beers in their hands. And I was like, this is a dream come true for me because like I've not even put a pin on a map at this point. They've somehow tracked it down from you know, looking at the live stream and going like that building is there, it, you know, and then so, you know, we keep walking and there's about 40 people by the end of it, all behind me, you know, giving that kind of like Pied Piper, like happy go lucky parade, like everyone with their mouth open kind of vibe, but just in the pouring rain. And it said to me, like, that's some proper dedication, like when people will turn up, because don't forget, most people were put off by rain. It's, it's rain, it's, it's wet. Like people won't do anything in the rain because that's how, you know, wimpy, <laughs> wimpy the human race is. Um, and, you know, out of nowhere, just like people coming, like getting involved in the pouring rain. And um, what was so funny is like, I slipped on a manhole cover with the rig on and like my phone fell out the thing um, and just like smashed on the floor. And, and but it was still going live and I like absolutely like ruined my knee but I was so kind of like pumped up on adrenaline that I just kind of like got straight back up and everyone was like are you okay and we were like yep put the phone back in finish it and like in yeah just I can't express the fact that it was in the rain and it was very much like it was kind of spiritual like I'm not I'm not I'm not a kind of guy that's like a spirituality man I'm not that kind of guy but it was very much a case of all of these people were here for the same reason um all of these people were here to be kind of like united by the music and the and the sound that I'm playing. And it was just a super humbling moment that people would turn up in the pouring rain on their Thursday night in a lockdown to come and like listen to me being being arse of the microphone, basically. Um, and yeah, so that was a real turning point. I was like, wow, this is a this is a really special thing that I'm being able to do. Uh, look, Love that. 
Yeah, I love the, the deeper me the deeper meaning underneath it because we we obviously see it. It's funny. You edit it. There's a lot of humor in it, but I love this deeper meaning that you have around bringing people together and you know the music spreading positivity and, and particularly in the pandemic it's done that loads but i think it's just lovely to see that that deeper layer to what's going on yeah definitely that you know that there's there's definitely an ulterior motive behind like doing it in the streets and it's to include everyone and anyone like um, you may have seen some of the secret sessions that i've been doing recently and because of the way that i've kind of like set up the content and it's very accessible and it appeals to everyone we've got three families in the woods with us on a, on a Saturday night, giving it, you know, giving it the arm in the air. And because it's so accessible, people feel that they can come along to it. And that's something that I never, ever want to lose. And by taking the, the beats to the street, which is, a, which is, I think it's just a great one line of taking the beats to the street. Um, you know, people are super engaged with it and I'm dancing with someone's going to, someone's going to, you know, take this out of context, but I'm dancing with kids uh, and Karen, who's 75, and including everyone. It's not a case of, you know, you can't come because of your race or because of your age or because of anything like that. It's it's super inclusive. It's, it's, it's the most inclusive DJ set that anyone can do. And um, that's something that I'm going to just continue to to emphasize and, and showcase that this is about everyone. It's not necessarily about me. It's about people's reactions to what we're doing. And, and I'm just the facilitator. Yeah, I, I love it. So we get, I'm going to flip this around the other way. Um, and I'm sure we'll find a positive message in this because we, we always do. But we live in a, a universe of duality for every up, there's a down, left, there's a right, positive, there's a negative. And um, what's been like a, a low moment and how did you push past it? I feel like, um, you know, it's, it's really, really easy to. I, I don't. I don't necessarily read comments and dwell on dwell on stuff like that. But people must think. Uh, well, people. I know that people do think that, like, bro, you must be so gas. You know, you've got seventy thousand followers. Like, you must be on top of the world. Like we said before the call, like followers are a good metric to to, to measure that you're improving. But when you have more followers, you also have you know, more haters, you have a lot of stresses that arise out of having a large following. Like, you know, the, the inbox is constantly full and a lot of it's good, a lot of it's positive, but there are some really, really deep things that you kind of wish you didn't read and you feel that once you've read it, a certain responsibility to fix it or reply to it. And the second that you do that, it's like you become attached to it. So I'm quite a I'm, you know, I, uh, I have a, a family situation where my, my sister uh, has cerebral palsy. So I'm in a quite a position of, of care with, with respect to that. So when you read messages like, uh, you know, I'm about to inject my third dose of heroin this evening. Or, you know, if you don't reply to me, I'm going to kill myself. Uh, and just like, just the most horrific stuff like that. That's what a lot of people don't see with having a big following. And most people, the way most people solve that is by not replying to messages whatsoever. Um, but I've always made a thing of, I need to stay connected with my fan base. They're the people that got me to this place and they're the people that are gonna get me to the places that I wanna go to. So we always reply to messages. We always open stuff and people are asking anything from, you know, I'm not a PT. People are asking for any advice on, <laughs> on how to deadlift or how to lose body fat or you know how to write a bass line. You know I'm not the best at writing bass lines, but people ask you for advice on anything because they perceive you as this you know this role model, which is great. That's what I'm do. I'm here to help people. But there is definitely a negative side which people don't see, um, especially when you kind of give yourself up in the sense that you, you you reply and you say, okay, I'm so sorry about your situation. Here's what I do, and then you become attached to it, and it's very hard to bear the weight of that on your shoulders whilst trying to be entertaining whilst trying to make beats every single day whilst you know even just checking for signal i mean i'm doing a, a, a kind of a personal challenge at the moment to walk 10 kilometers every single day for 100 days so it's like juggling all of this stuff while doing that whilst thinking about you know other people that have messaged you and sharing that responsibility on your on, on your personal self um it can be really really tough you know it can be tough but i'm not going to kind of take the easy option and just not reply to messages I think that's that, that's an easy option. I, I do want to help people on a, on a on a on a massive scale, and I feel like 
you know, preaching stuff where it's broadcasted, where it's on, it's on a level where everyone can listen to it and everyone can tune in, like live content, like we're doing now on a podcast. It helps a lot of people, and that's what I want to continue to do. But there, there, there's definitely some, you know, some heavy aspects to social media and having a big following where people feel like they can message you. It's kind of different because you probably wouldn't be messaging, you know, Jamie Jones for advice on fat loss or Jamie Jones on mental health advice. But because I preach about it and I say, you know, here's things that you can do to improve your, your mental well-being or here's what I've been doing to, to lose body fat. People message you, people inquire, you know, and I, and I encourage that. But it's, it's that negative aspect which, which can weigh you down. Uh, but overall, I've not had a bad live stream. Like every live stream I do, um, you know, it makes me feel really, really great because I, I, I see the comments after, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not like analyzing the comments like this guy's an asshole and, you know, going like, oh no, I'm an asshole. Like my life's ruined. But I just like people saying, you know, this has made my Thursday or, you know, whatever it is. That pays me. That, that, that pays me in, in a way that money doesn't pay me. Yeah, totally. And I, I mean, we were talking about this just before we started as well. It's, it is the reality of it. The higher you climb, the more you're seen, um, the more you're going to get people throwing rocks at you. The, the, I love the quote, like the, the more of a shining light you are in the world, the more you'll attract bugs. So yeah. obviously we're not talking about the people who are reaching out with the, the deep questions for you, but the, the people who are going, oh, you're this, you're that, you're, you know. What is your message for people who, you know, disgruntled DJs and people who've been at this for a long time and they're looking at you, you're, you're blowing up, they're almost certainly begrudging that <laughs> fact. And, and I imagine people are saying, oh, it's a gimmick, it's this, it's not serious, it's, oh, it's yeah. whatever. Yeah. What is your message for people like that? Well, do you know what? I like I, it's it's hard to scroll through Facebook nowadays without seeing someone trolling or someone complaining or or someone posting a status complaining about you know oh nowadays like all you have to do is just be a personality to be a DJ. My my message to to kind of the the the, the haters or the people that, that that are doing that is like while you're busy typing a status and complaining i'm busy overtaking you so i would say focus on your own journey and if for example you know you've been producing for 25 years and you've still not released any music and you're dedicating your whole life to it then something's wrong i think i think you know and that is internally going to affect uh, affect whoever it is so you know I, the, the, i'm not going to name any names but there's a couple of djs that I've had to unfriend them on Facebook because all they do is complain about the way the market is and the way social media is. And, it, and it's like adapt, improvise and overcome or we're all going to overtake you and you're just going to be complaining your whole life. And I think that's a, that's a big personality trait to have as a DJ or just, you know, as anyone who wants to reach the moon is like you have to improvise and you have to overcome and you, you have to be able to adapt to a situation. Uh, moving forward like for anyone that has time to complain about another dj or time to mess like share my post and say look at this gimmick all the time that you're spending doing that i'm working and overtaking yeah blinding with your excellence I I exactly exactly and i don't you know i don't pay much attention to the haters i feel like um it's it's a case of killing with kindness you know i don't i don't i don't look at other djs and say i hate them or i'm you know, I'm envious of them. I feel like <clears throat> envy can be a bad thing. Don't get me wrong. It's, you have to idolize people. You have to have people that you say, that guy's done it the way I want to do it or that, that, that guy's at the level that I want to be at. You have to have idols to be able to keep, you know, keep progressing and work your way up that ladder. But if you're the type of person that's envious and commenting like, oh, is this, is this all it takes nowadays? You're already in the wrong mindset and mind space there. You're already failing and you set yourself up for a loss because... You look at the, you know, the richest people, the most famous people on the planet. They're not like, oh, I'm not going to answer your question because it might be invalid or, or anything like that. It's about, you know, it's about, yeah, I've, I've said my piece on that. 
This is, I mean, you, at the end of the day, people who do that are creating a psychological barrier for themselves that they don't realise. It's like, I know people who will walk down the street and see somebody drive by in like a, like a Ferrari or something with a top down, designer clothes on, tunes, tunes kicking. First thing they'll say is, oh, I love me, who do you love? Look at that dick in that Ferrari. Yeah. So what are you telling yourself, ultimately, that this is not something you ever want? Because if you had that, everyone would think you're a dick. Yeah. If you get the fast route to success, if you find something that blows up, if you find a way to get there, everyone's going to be saying bad things about you. So psychologically, you hold yourself back without even realising it. Yeah. It's, it's so, so important to see other people doing well and wishing them well and to come from a place of service and positivity, which is everything you've talked about, caring about your fan base and being an ambassador for people and positivity. And you're serving something bigger, so you will grow. It's the people who look at everyone else. And as you said, they the envy, it's hurt people, hurt people. Yeah. The people but... who write the comments are saying, I could never have this for me, so how dare you have this? Yeah. And yeah. creating that literally a psychological barrier to stop their own progress without even realising that they're doing it. Yeah, which yeah. is the, the crazy thing so you know for anyone who's, who's doing that and the other thing that I'll, I'll just cycle back round on is you mentioning um you know about adapting there's this scene in the matrix right and it's where neo are you familiar with the matrix Most, oh, you're, you're, I was watching it the other night if that's familiar enough for you beautiful so there is a scene right where neo goes to see the oracle and he's got a spoon he's trying right. to bend the spoon right and he can't do it. And the oracle says, don't, uh, uh, don't bend the spoon, bend yourself. Okay. And this is the thing. It's complaining about the situation, the market, the environment, other people. Yeah. You're not going to change that stuff. The key to success is to change yourself and to adapt. Yeah. And I, I love that film for all of those little Allergy. nuts yeah. that are through it. It's such a beautiful parallel to life you know yeah. well look it's been amazing talking to you buddy what what can we expect from you coming up where can people like obviously we're seeing you online but i know you're gigs and, and all of this stuff where can people come and interact with you and like say hello say ahoy and all of that good yeah. stuff i can't wait to get the, the world's biggest ahoy i'm probably going to apply for a guinness world record and get everyone behind me and do one like that um awesome. But you know, um, I've got I've got a massive UK club tour, um, which we which we it's still kind of unreleased. I haven't put any artwork up for that yet. So you know, people can catch me at clubs all over the UK over the next three months. Um, but what I plan to do is tie my season, which we're on season three right now, tie the content reel in with uh, the clubbing. So for example, if I'm playing in Leeds, I'll be stepping in Leeds, uh, you know, that Thursday. Or if I'm you know if I'm playing in Bournemouth. I'll be doing a beach clean in Bournemouth that Saturday. So there's loads of opportunities for people to come and get involved either as a dancer or as a spectator or, you know, just as a punter at the club um, from, you know, secret sessions to beach cleans to street parades to group boot camps. Like I'm literally going to do it all over the next three months and, um, and meet everyone in person. It's, it's very much a case of right now. I know a lot of people. Uh, I've got a lot of friends, but they're all virtual. <laughs> and because just because of the way the situation has been um but i intend over the next three months to convert those virtual relationships into in-person relationships and just create content with people who have been supporting me for the last year and a half um and then you know uk tour europe tour america tour and hopefully then i'm just going to do a moon tour as well <laughs> Well, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it past you. I really wouldn't. You're, I mean, you're blowing up. You're a super nice guy. It's so clear that you're, you've got a heart of gold for this stuff as well. Yeah. I wish you every success with it, mate. I, if it keeps doubling and doubling and doubling, I think that's absolutely incredible. So, I wish you all the best with it. Thank you so much for coming on the show you shared an absolute ton of gold and i've been keeping an eye on what people are saying they're loving all the value bombs that you're dropping as well i know when this goes live as the podcast people are absolutely gonna uh, love it as well so dude thank you so much for joining me and for doing the first ever live recording of the podcast it's been amazing ahoy, <laughs> ahoy indeed take care my friend i'll speak thanks. to you soon peace and love guys bye 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 bye, bye.